So hello everybody, my name is Irina Pert and uh, this is uh, the seminar from the series Understanding Sobornist that are hosted by the School of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of Tartu. And these uh, uh, seminars are part of the project, a research project run by the same School of Theology um, it is focusing on uh, conciliarity and conciliar practices um, in Estonian uh, Orthodox Church in uh, the long 20th century. And today our speaker is uh, Tamara Grzelice, and she will be introduced by the member of our project, uh, um, Andrei Shishkov. And after that, we will have our discussion. Um, Andrei, please. Floor is yours. Thank you, thank you Irina. Uh, I am very glad to introduce uh, Tamara Garzelidze, professor of Ilya State University in Belize. Uh, from January of uh, 2001 through December uh, 2013, she served in Geneva, Switzerland, as a program executive for the WCC Commission on Faith and Order. Uh, professor uh, Garzelidze is known not only for her writings in theology and church history and uh, ecumenical work, but also for her diplomatic work uh, from uh, uh, 2014 uh, to 2018. She was an extraordinary and uh, uh, plenipotentiary ambassador of Georgia to the Vatican. Uh, also, uh, Professor Gerdzelidze had a researcher uh, position at the Tbilisi State University and Toronto University. Uh, uh, she's now uh, preparing uh, for the publication of her new book uh, on contemporary local Orthodox churches in the context of uh, political processes and the uh, church-state relations in particular. Uh, much attention is given to the topic of uh, correlation between Christian and national identities. This topic uh, sounds more relevant today uh, than ever, uh, on the one hand, because of the condemnation of the doctrine of uh, so-called Russian world, uh, on the other hand, because of the continuing process of, of forming uh, national churches, such as uh, the church, uh, Orthodox Church in Ukraine. Uh, this is important because uh, in discussing issues of ecclesial synodality, uh, the role of modern states and other political institutions seems uh, to be left out of the equation. Uh, in, in the uh, meantime, uh, their influence is um, considerable. Uh, since uh, we uh, invited Tamara very recently, she has not prepared any presentation and uh, our seminar will be held uh, in the same format as the last one with uh, Aristotle Papa Nicolaou. In the first part, uh, Irina and I uh, will ask uh, Tamara questions. And uh, uh, in the second part, uh, all the participants of the seminar will be able to do so. Uh, it seems uh, to me that last uh, time uh, this format ha had a success, uh, which I'm sure we can repeat today. Uh, we would like to discuss uh, several topics today, uh, which can be grouped in, in, into two. Uh, first one, uh, the role of the modern secular state uh, in the formation of uh, conciliarity in the church. And the second one, uh, the relationship between Christian and national identities and their influence on, uh, on the topic of uh, conciliarity. But first, uh, we would like to hear more about your uh, new book uh, so that the participants uh, of our seminar and YouTube uh, listeners uh, will understand what, is, uh, what it is about and uh, uh, what prompted you uh, to write it. And uh, now I invite to uh, answer uh, Tamara, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Andre, for your kind introduction. Um, yes, uh, um, it's, uh, mm, uh, this book is uh, um, hopefully coming out uh, beginning of the next year, that was the mm, uh, calculation uh, given to me, so um, actually I uh, uh, handed it over uh, at the end of the 2019, so I uh, had to go through the chapter which I sent you because I, I wasn't sure I remembered everything 
what I uh, what was written there. But um, I would like to tell you about the um, idea of this book. Yes, uh, this I certainly remember well because it's been uh, not something uh, that I uh, um, invented or I just uh, decided or let let uh, let me write a book on this. Somehow it's been uh, this uh, what, what I'm. Um, reflecting on in this book has been uh, uh, my reflection over the years since especially the work I started in Geneva uh, because uh, as Andre mentioned I um, was working with the Commission on Faith and Order uh, which is a theological commission and um, I was representing uh, the orthodoxy so it's a sort of uh, in another language, I, uh, I had an, um, I, I was representing the Orthodox desk, uh, and because of that, I um, uh, had the, uh, an opportunity to uh, be with the uh, representatives of uh, churches, uh, all churches, but especially the Orthodox churches, and um, most of uh, those people were uh, hierarchs or clergy, uh, but also theologians. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, struggle and uh, uh, this uh, uh, really enthusiasm or wish of the uh, desire of the Orthodox to be part of this uh, family, you know, or the Christian family, but also this uh, uh, real struggle uh, to do so was something that uh, 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 struck me in the beginning and then I, I sort of uh, I was thinking about it and reflecting on it uh, all the way through and I spent 13 years there so I had quite a lot of time to think about it. Um, so that's um, actually something uh, uh, very noticeable if you come close to the work of the Orthodox as a group, you know, Orthodox, not of from one church, but Orthodox, when they represent the family of the Orthodox uh, with other groups or either in bilateral or in a multi multilateral setting, you see this, uh, um, you almost start uh, having pity over the people who uh, want to uh, proceed, but somehow they are kept uh, back. You know, they are, they cannot really, uh, um, speak freely or uh, think or rather freely and that that was uh, something that triggered this uh, uh, idea of writing a book about um, ecclesiology and certainly then this uh, um, all the uh, experiences that I had uh, uh, in Geneva but also in uh, Rome was very uh, interesting uh, to uh, form uh, for the formation of this um, idea of what I want to write on. And in fact, this book is, uh, the chapter which I sent is certainly on, um, uh, tries to uh, uh, deal with the um, church, uh, with the uh, Christian and uh, national identities and how they interact and how under the modern uh, secular state uh, people uh, can be both uh, citizens and Christians. But uh, uh, basically, uh, um, I think my, uh, uh, not really discovery, but you know, the idea what I want to pursue in throughout this book is that um, Orthodox uh, refuse to uh, um, uh, reflect seriously over the issue of autocephaly. Autocephaly has been you know, there are pages, hundreds of pages, thousands of pages dedicated to autocephaly, but in a rather holistic view to take all the aspects of uh, uh, autocephaly into account uh, that these autocephalous churches uh, uh, are part of the, uh, this uh, um, complex realities, uh, especially in Eastern Europe um, and uh, uh, where, um, these newly formed uh, uh, democratic structures and uh, national identities are uh, in, a, in uh, there is in, imbalance between the two because national identities are certainly 
playing a greater role in uh, identity, uh, general identity um, form, formation and uh, in general life, then uh, uh, this uh, participation in democratic uh, society. So at this interaction, uh, how does it affect uh, uh, the life uh, in the church, which affects so strongly uh, the life in general? And certainly my, uh, um, I, I can't talk uh, about all uh, Orthodox churches, although I try to consult other Orthodox um, uh, contexts as well, but my uh, major um, sort of point of interest is Georgia. Uh, so I also point it out in, in this uh, book that, uh, or manuscript, it's, a, it's still a manuscript, that, uh, uh, you know, it's a view on autocephaly from the periphery, because um, most of the writings that we read, for instance, on nationalism or um, other issues or autocephaly, uh, they are uh, views uh, given uh, from um, most important or major points like Russian view or Greek view. But this is Georgia, which has very different history also. Um, so nationalism also unfolds in a very different way than it unfolds in uh, other places, I mean, which is understandable. Uh, it's a specific uh, context. So uh, this was the trigger um, point for me to uh, embrace this uh, uh, issue. Certainly, uh, I can't uh, be um, expert uh, in all these fields. So my expertise, really, real expertise, lies in uh, knowing these churches, uh, uh, especially uh, Church of Georgia, uh, Church of uh, Russia, uh, and a little bit uh, Church of Ukraine. So these are my three major contexts that I try to um, address. Uh, but uh, uh, so my uh, the major uh, um, strengths of sort to, to say uh, uh, of this uh, inquiry is that I come, uh, uh, I try to see these uh, things from one place or uh, which is Georgia, but Georgia cannot be, uh, especially in the last 200 years and more, uh, uh, cannot be seen uh, separately from Russian uh, context. So that's the, um, and then uh, from that on, I did try to develop uh, these views into the theories. Sorry. I, I would just like to continue from uh, uh, where uh, 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 Tamara finished because uh, the, ch the chapter which um, uh, you've shared uh, with us, which I understand, you know, is work in progress. I mean, it, it actually is more about your methodology and uh, your general approach uh, rather than about um, the focus yes. that you've just uh, pointed out because I, I, I think uh, this uh, idea of viewing autocephaly from the periphery, it, it, you know, seems you know very uh, intriguing to, to, to me. And um, I'm, maybe I would like to ask you a little to kind of explain a bit more um, what constitutes uh, the um, well. I mean, I don't know if we can use the term of uniqueness, but certainly distinct, distinctive uh, features of uh, Georgian autocephaly, uh, because um, as, a, uh, as we know from, from history, uh, that was one of the uh, ancient autocephalous churches in, in the Orthodox family. And after 1811, it, it lost its, uh, you know, 1,500 years of, of, of autocephaly and became part of the church that was much younger than the Georgian church, the, the, the Russian uh, Orthodox church. And I think um, the way to, in which it's been assimilated was, uh, uh, you know, extremely um, imperialistic, even compared to the uh, Armenian church that had preserved some of its in internal structure. And um, so what I'm puzzled about is how after the uh, um, this process of assimilation, uh, the Georgian church 
has still kind of managed, you know, to to keep its um, um, uh, well connection, you know, with this, uh, you know, ancient uh, um, um, kind of connection with the Georgian uh, national identity. But I, I understand that you know Georgian nationalism also was you know pretty much secular in in, in, in the uh, period that led you know to the revolution. So we know that you know Georgian uh, um, Marxists and you know, social democrats were among most uh, radical in, in in the Russian Empire. And yet you know what we see you know in the post-Soviet period that the church and church managed kind of to regain its place, you know, in, in the nation. So it's kind of very big question, but maybe you could uh, uh, give us some, some clues about uh, uh, what is so special about church and autocephaly and why this view from periphery can be um, enlightening uh, for us because as you said, you know, we, we used to look at uh, Orthodox churches from the perspective of these big players, you know, uh, the, the, the Greeks and Russians certainly. So what will Georgia teach us about autocephaly? Well, thank you, Irina. Yeah, I don't think it uh, can teach uh, others about how to maintain autocephaly, but it teaches, definitely teaches that autocephaly is much more complex than uh, we learn from textbooks or we learn from uh, major conferences, let's say. Because for instance, uh, uh, imagine that uh, Iberia, uh, we're talking about, yeah, this is also confusing. I mean, you know, his historical names, we say Georgia, but you, there was no Georgia in the fourth century when uh, uh, it became uh, Christian, it was Iberia, right? So uh, uh, when Iberia, uh, became Christian, uh, yeah, it uh, 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 was the Roman Empire, it was uh, re uh, received, uh, it received uh, first emissaries from uh, um, uh, the Roman Empire, the um, Enlightener Nino came from uh, Rome, I mean, she was from uh, Asia Minor, but you know, from the Roman um, uh, borders. And uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, thing was that she, uh, that uh, uh, Iberia um, was uh, uh, um, immediately became a state church. Yeah, that's that's what is known about uh, Georgia. That uh, it's one of the oldest uh, um, churches, uh, Christianities, which uh, immediately became a state religion. Yes. Um, so in the fourth century after uh, Armenia and uh, um, Ethiopia uh, is also taken as a uh, oldest uh, state religion, uh, state Christianity. Um, but uh, you know, a specific thing about uh, autocephaly, I mean, also this is also very, uh, you all know, so I'm not going to explain this to you that it's a very, um, sort of uh, uh, not exactly the word we are using. There is no mention of autocephaly in the fourth century or fifth century. I mean, fourth century, I forget about fourth century, fifth century from where, uh, from the period when uh, Georgia uh, uh, um, started claiming its uh, uh, autocephaly. But uh, yeah, uh, it is, it's a, a Debatable uh, uh, question, what was it? But there was certainly, uh, there were uh, uh, church reforms towards the end of the fifth century, uh, uh, which uh, uh, gave to uh, the church in Iberia uh, independence from uh, the church of Antioch, because that's uh, our mother church, uh, Antioch and uh, uh, not full independence. Then uh, more independence is coming in the seventh century Then full independence is coming in the uh, uh, ninth century and 11th century. So it's, uh, it goes into step by step. Uh, but uh, today, you know, we say, I don't know, the church claims that it uh, has in uh, autocephaly from the fifth century. Well, academically probably it's not 
accurate, but uh, this is the church tradition, sort of. So we we take it as as it goes, and. Um, Interesting that uh, autocephaly, which was uh, uh, something uh, invented or uh, um, taken for granted within the Byzantine Empire, uh, uh, was uh, um, given, granted, not, I don't know, but somehow was uh, um, attained by uh, the king that I mentioned uh, towards the end of the fifth century from Byzantine Empire. But Georgia was not part of the Byzantine Commonwealth. So, I mean, this already uh, speaks about the uh, interesting case. It's a periphery, it's not part of the uh, empire. And it uh, uh, obtains uh, a certain uh, self governance, uh, which uh, then, with ages, it interprets it as uh, autocephaly. So, you know, that, that teaches us something about, yeah, and then why this king was so keen on uh, gaining uh, autocephaly is clear to, uh, you know, broaden the uh, state borders, to uh, invite as many Christians from neighboring uh, lands as possible. So to make it the center for others uh, who, who wanted to be Christians or who were already Christians. So then uh, it's a very different um, matter what you mentioned about the uh, 19th century. So yes, this uh, uh, church, which was uh, uh, considered autocephalous uh, from the early times, okay, let's not be specific about the age, but from the uh, ancient times, uh, uh, under the uh, annexation of Jew, um, um, kingdoms of uh, Kartli and Kaheti, which is East and West Georgia, uh, East, uh, both are Eastern Georgian um, uh, kingdoms were at the time, beginning of the uh, 19th century. Uh, then uh, the uh, state, uh, uh, Russian state, abolished autocephaly. But in a way, it was not uh, unexpected because uh, uh, they didn't have a patriarchate themselves, so why would they keep a patriarch in a, in a, an ex territory? That was, you know, they, uh, I mean, when Georgians uh, first uh, in 1783 made the first uh, agreement with Russia, there was a clause about the church, and uh, they couldn't make a decision, and they they decided to have a separate uh, um, sort of discussion. Uh, additional discussion about what to do about this uh, orthodoxy in Georgia because it was there. And uh, how could the Tsarist Russia uh, acknowledge the uh, independent uh, church within the, uh, within the annexed territory? So, and, but then as it happens when uh, they decide to have an, an extra, extra uh, meeting or extra committee or an extra decision, then it never happened. So uh, then, you know, uh, after the annexation, which happened in 1801, in 10 years, in 1811, uh, the last patriarch of Georgia was invited to Russia and then was given uh, uh, a nice place to stay. So he was kept there until his end, until the, his death. So that was another uh, case which uh, um, is interesting about, uh, yeah, this especially inter-Orthodox um, uh, dynamics, yeah? Yes, and then uh, as soon as the uh, revolution happened uh, in uh, Russia, um, then Georgians, uh, February revolution, 1917, Georgians declared in March, uh, uh, restoration of autocephaly, and, uh, but the Russians did not accept it for some time until 1943, when Stalin insisted with Russian uh, hierarchs that they should have accepted uh, the autocephaly. So autocephaly is a very interesting uh, uh, concept as we understand. So this is uh, this is really fascinating, but I I don't want to monopolize the floor. I think uh, Andre had some uh, questions as well, but maybe we could uh, continue uh, the uh, question on um, autocephaly uh, in 
relation to, to other issues? Um, yes, I, I would like to ask uh, maybe to uh, expand uh, the geography uh, of, uh, of uh, these uh, processes of granting autocephaly and uh, how uh, church and political institutions um, were involved in it, uh, but uh, to uh, to move uh, to the modern uh, era, uh, to modern times, and uh, um, I I would like to ask about uh, about the um, role of uh, political institution in it. If we turn to the history uh, of the Orthodox Church, uh, we see that political power has always uh, been a participant in conciliar church processes. Uh, the Byzantine Empire presided uh, over councils and the rulers of, the, of other Orthodox countries did the same uh, following uh, his example. But uh, this era was pre secular. Uh, and uh, however, even in the secular era, uh, the proclaimed uh, separation of the church and state uh, did not prevent political authorities uh, from participating in church affairs. In the modern era, uh, when the formation of uh, modern nation states uh, began, uh, political authorities uh, participated in church councils, uh, but uh, in other ways than uh, for example, in, in, in pre-secular uh, times. Uh, this was the case in the Balkans in the 19th century uh, we, with their church uh, people's councils about which Thomas Bremer spoke in our seminar uh, uh, a year ago. Uh, the Moscow Council of uh, 1970 uh, and uh, 1918 uh, had delegates from the State Duma, uh, it was a Russian Republic uh, Parliament, uh, the State Council uh, government, and the Academy of Science, which was also a secular institution. Uh, in recent history, the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine, the Ukrainian Parliament, asked uh, in 2018 uh, for the Ecumenical Patriarch to begin the process of granting autocephaly to the Ukrainian Church. At the same time, uh, Orthodox ecclesiology uh, tries to construct a theory of conciliarity that ignores the political factor and tries to create a space of pure uh, ecclesiality. My question is, uh, how adequate is this, uh, this creation of uh, pure ecclesial uh, theory? Um, and uh, should Orthodox uh, ecclesiology include a political institution? Can a secular parliament, for example, be considered uh, an ecclesiastical authority and in what sense? Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, um, the, uh, the only way uh, church uh, clergy or um, rather hierarchs can be uh, part of the you know, um, political uh, power uh, is when the church is established. Like, right? uh, for instance, in, in the uh, in the UK, uh, yes, there is a, the Church of England is an established church, and uh, some of the bishops are members of the uh, House of the Lords. Yeah, but uh, in, uh, in uh, countries with the uh, democracy. You know, democratic structures. It, I mean, democratic structures are there too. But with the um, uh, uh, where the churches are non not uh, um, non established, this is uh, impossible. But it happens, as we know. For instance, in the recent past, uh, um, there were cases when uh, Georgian uh, bishops uh, uh, demanded to be a part of the uh, discussion of certain um, issues uh, uh, in the parliament. But for that reason, uh, the, it's not, uh, does not come out of nothing because uh, in 2002, there was a special agreement made between the uh, church and state in Georgia, which guarantees uh, uh, some kind of special role uh, of uh, uh, the Orthodox church in history of Georgia and therefore, uh, gives uh, 
some uh, uh, freedom of movement uh, uh, within political uh, spheres. So it can be interpreted in different ways, but you know it is not very well defined. So you know I teach it actually in my courses. So it's it's so badly uh, drafted. I don't know. In 2002, even the language is so bad. So, uh, but then um, uh, this happens. But you know, in my view, I try to address this in uh, my writing. That I think that uh, the Orthodox Church is uh, a part of the uh, conciliar uh, uh, endeavor of Orthodox Churches should be to understand that uh, uh, you know autocephaly has nothing to do today with. Uh, uh, political power, but uh, uh, for this reason they have to uh, interpret. That's why I bring so much uh, uh, theory also in this chapter, which I sent you on secularists, for instance, because uh, if uh, churches should not come uh, um, in agreement with this, that they are part of the secular society, they will not be able to uh, make this uh, final sort of um, um, uh, not, uh, you know, the sort of separation uh, with the state. I, they still think, yeah, the, the problem of, uh, like in Russia for sure, and in Georgia is that the Orthodox Church is a state within a state. So that's the problem. You know, they want to be uh, independent and uh, th that's their uh, contemporary interpretation of autocephaly in a way. You know, they, they uh, because they uh, keep, they uh, carry this memory, uh, which, you know, we, we still live uh, everywhere. Orthodox churches live with the Byzantine memory, imperial memory. Uh, and uh, uh, with this memory, they uh, decide that, uh, okay, their uh, independence or whatever autocephaly means today, self-governance, okay, autonomy. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that gives them uh, um, the power to uh, be uh, politically uh, involved, uh, but, but it's not always, it's also very contextual. For instance, the political involvement of the Church of Georgia is very different from Church of Russia. Russian church, because uh, here it's opposite. It's not like uh, um, C uh, Kirill uh, prepares something for Putin and uh, is happy if, people, if Putin accepts it. No, it's on the contrary. Here, the government is very much uh, keen on uh, having uh, uh, good relations with the church and, uh, uh, you know, but certainly the church uh, receives uh, some other benefits from the government. But, you know, that's a uh, completely different dynamic, although the same uh, um, mechanism is working at work, the same mechanism at work, yeah. I don't know if I answered your question, but I tried. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I, I, I see your point uh, is very, very good uh, and very interesting. Uh, I have one more question, but I think uh, we should give our uh, participants of, uh, of the seminar uh, an opportunity to ask questions. And uh, please uh, raise your hands uh, and uh, ask uh, Tamara um, what, what do you want her to know. <laughs> um, yes, uh, uh, first question from Jan. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you for taking the time to explain your work to us. I, I for the chapter we had to read was uh, quite interesting. Um, I do want for my question. I do want to return to something you said um, just in in your introduction, um, which relates to the Russia and uh, Georgia Church uh, Orthodox Church relations, um, because I wondered if after. Uh, the 2008 uh, conflict, anything changed and in, in what sense? Um, because I could imagine that maybe the Orthodox Church became more um, particular about its uh, Georgian identity, or uh, on the other end, it might be that the church uh, didn't distance itself from Russia and therefore that the divide between 
um, the government and the church became bigger. So I wanted to ask uh, what were the developments um, as a case of this? Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, for the question. Yes, um, the, it's an <laughs> interesting uh, balance of powers with, uh, in Georgia because uh, on the one hand, uh, you know, this strong national identity, if uh, any of you have ever been to Georgia, you understand that we have a very different language from any other languages in the world and uh, our alphabet and we're very proud of it and, you know, Georgians and so on. But on the other hand, uh, um, uh, yes, it uh, the church, which is uh, which uh, um, uh, in the uh, awake in the um, time of awakening of uh, uh, this uh, um, independence, you know, uh, towards the end of the eighties, uh, became a very strong uh, national uh, player uh, in Georgia. Uh, for instance, in 86, they uh, canonized uh, one of the, uh, the most, probably one of the most uh, uh, well-known figure in Georgia, Ilya Javadze, uh, who was a poet and a political figure, and um, he was canonized. Uh, and there was also debate about it, whether he could be canonized because he played cards, for instance. Uh, and he was uh, he smoked and things like this, but he was a really a big figure in the uh, history of Georgia. And um, in fact, uh, maybe he was not uh, uh, um, he did not uh, witness to uh, his uh, holiness uh, to the Christian world, but he um, uh, he was uh, very concerned about the social uh, um, uh, question you know, about equality. And in that uh, way, I think that uh, he was canonized. Uh, uh, it was the right thing to canonize him, not because he was a hero of uh, the Georgian people or, you know, the leader of Georgian nation. And uh, uh, at that time, as soon as Georgian church uh, sort of, you know, uh, how uh, churches sense this, where when they can, uh, uh, pick up on this leadership and uh, it was really in the air so the uh, church picked it up end of the 80s like starting from uh, starting from this for instance what I said that uh, canonizing such a popular uh, person I mean there is no person in Georgia who would uh, say anything against Ilya Javadze. he was uh, su such an important figure in the uh, end of the uh, second half of the uh, 19th century and then, uh, now, uh, Russian dynamics. Uh, immediately, uh, end of the 80s, uh, beginning of the 90s, uh, uh, this, uh, there was a, a serious uh, um, tendency appeared all of a sudden uh, in uh, the church, uh, a strong anti-ecumenical, very strong anti-ecumenical, to the extent that uh, um, the past life of uh, Ilya, who was uh, heavily involved in uh, World Council of Churches activities and uh, was a figure, uh, for some time even was uh, one of the presidents of the WCC, um, he was uh, opposed and uh, there was a danger of a schism on this basis, you know. So this uh, uh, a strong uh, um, invasion sort of of anti-ecumenism uh, definitely comes uh, from Russia uh, because this was one of the means to isolate Georgia, you know, because not to, uh, to prevent uh, Georgia from uh, making its own links with uh, uh, or to find more ways for that to prevent Georgia from making links with uh, uh, outside of uh, Russia and outside of that domain. And we see that it uh, still continues. I mean, what Russia is doing now in Ukraine is a pure continuation of the same policy that uh, Russia, uh, but now they became um, uh, even uh, greedier, I think, because they want to uh, not only to restore the Soviet Union, but uh, the empire, Russian empire, yeah, so they uh, go further. So that's uh, the dynamic. And unfortunately, uh, I must say, I can't say for sure 
that uh, the whole Georgian church is uh, uh, corrupt by the uh, um, Russian influence at the moment, but there is a very a serious influence of the Russians and they use this soft power uh, well, uh, but uh, there are also other voices. But yeah, the influence is very strong at the moment. Uh, Paul, uh, please. Uh, yes, um, uh, Tamara, let me ask you, uh, you may have just answered the question uh, about the decision of the Georgian Orthodox Church not to participate in the 2016 uh, Pan-Orthodox Council. Um, two questions, uh, how do you explain that decision and was there opposition to it within the Georgian Church. Yes. yes, thank you uh, for this question. Yes, in 2016 was uh, uh, not a big surprise. Uh, the surprise was uh, the preparation process when Georgians went, uh, at, or all of them went to these meetings and somehow uh, it was clear that they would not uh, <laughs> make to the end, but we hoped that it, it would happen. Uh, anyway, yes, uh, I call it the satellites of the Russian church, Georgia and Bulgaria and uh, you know, Antioch, Syria. Uh, they didn't go, these four churches didn't go to Crete and it's clear. Well, uh, Russians, I think are, uh, you know, they know uh, our psychology very well. Well, I'm sure uh, I have not uh, read anything about it or I, I cannot uh, give you a documented sort of uh, um, uh, proof of it, but I'm sure that the Russians uh, told uh, Georgians that, oh, you are the oldest church and uh, you, know, you must uh, make your own decision. And then uh, Georgians made the decision that they don't agree with the uh, something, you know, about um, one of the documents. I mean, the documents were so poor anyway. I mean, it, they, they reduced it to, to almost nothing in order to make this happen, the Crete Council. So, and then uh, why would they meet if they would not discuss these documents? But anyway, so, and then uh, when the Georgians uh, um, were the first, uh, no, I think uh, there was, um, uh, this issue of uh, uh, this jurisdictional issue uh, also between Jerusalem and Antioch, yes? So I think Antioch was the first. But Georgia, uh, in, in terms of uh, Russian uh, church, Georgians were the first who said they were not going. And uh, even I think in one of the interviews uh, of the Russian hierarch, uh, I read that uh, when oldest church uh, is not going, uh, one of the oldest church uh, is not going, we will not go either. Something like this, you know? That, so there was a, a very uh, poorly fabricated, uh, uh, which many people understood immediately. There is a, an opposition, there was an opposition to it. And until now it uh, emerges uh, from time to time, this question that Georgians didn't go to Crete. Uh, uh, but not, uh, and also among the hierarchs, there were uh, at least two, I remember, who spoke openly about it, that they uh, had to go. But, you know, there are uh, more than 40 bishops in the council, so it's not very easy to uh, find a common voice. And uh, I, I, I saw uh, Elisan's uh, hand uh, raised. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I was going to ask exactly the same question as Paul, which is why I put my hand down. But um, can I continue from what you said in answer to Paul's question and ask about the, well, both the reaction of, um, of the Georgian church to the events of 2000, 2008 and also at the present time uh, with the war in, Georgia, in Ukraine? Um, how is the Georgian church reacting to that? Yes, again, strangely, I would say there is no consistency 
uh, yeah, that, that's, I think, uh, the worst side of this uh, institution. As an institution, okay, church has patriarchate, which is an institution, they should be more consistent. But in 2008, I think uh, Andre also asked this question. In 2008, um, yes, uh, there, uh, the church uh, spoke uh, against the war, certainly about, against the killing. Uh, but uh, there was a strange development to that, uh, that the patriarch decided he was younger. I mean, it was like uh, 16 years ago. No, oh, yeah, uh, 14 years ago. Um, the the uh, patriarch decided that he would go to Moscow himself and uh, talk to Kirill and Putin and uh, um, you know, and he did it. So I think uh, at that time I even uh, blamed the, our government because they shouldn't have allowed him because if he uh, lost this uh, touch with reality, the others should have told him that, I mean, he would not achieve anything. So it was a miserable uh, uh, sort of uh, move on his part, I think, that he went to Moscow asking what? To, to give back Abkhazia and uh, South Ossetia, which is a bit funny, yeah. But uh, in 2000, now that there is a war now in Ukraine, uh, I even posted something on Facebook page, where, which I started again after the war. So I, I said no to Facebook, but then with this war, I cannot stay. Uh, silent somehow. So uh, I think uh, uh, on the very first day, the uh, church made a statement uh, that the church opposes any killing or war or violence. So general, you know, nothing special. No, no mention of Russia, no mention of uh, uh, invading uh, territory of, uh, of a sovereign uh, state, nothing like this. Uh, but uh, now, uh, within uh, weeks, we hear some things, uh, we hear more about uh, uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, but not uh, a conciliar decision, no synod is uh, gathered to say something uh, in one voice, um, uh, some, uh, I mean, some hierarchs who are absolutely have, in my view, uh, they have no authority, uh, but they still, but now they say that uh, Kirill is a, um, non, he's non-Christian, he's, uh, uh, so they criticize this, uh, the role of the church, Russian church in the war. But um, if you ask uh, the uh, question about what the church says, nothing, I mean, Separate people say something, not the church. Thank you so much. Uh, and the next question from Natalia Vasilevich. Yes, hello. I am I'm in train, so I don't know if my connection is uh, well enough. Uh, so I wanted to ask uh, the same question, but from the angle of Tamara's other uh, uh, experience of being uh, ambassador in uh, Vatican at the Holy See, uh, the position of uh, a Pope uh, on uh, this, um, by what is it's motivated this position, uh, quite unclear position on the um, Russian invasion into um, Ukraine, and if we can expect that uh, Pope will meet uh, Patriarch Kirill uh, in Jerusalem, as uh, there are some information that in June there will be meeting. Do you think it will happen or not? Yes, Natalka, thank you for your question. Uh, you, as probably you remember in 2016 when the, the Pope met uh, Peter Kirill uh, in the airport in um, Havana. Oh, I was uh, really <laughs> very upset about this meeting because in my view, uh, and I uh, give this um, my view, uh, when uh, uh, Catholic uh, the journalists ask me, I always they say, say this, that um, Catholics should be more careful not to make, uh, um, uh, not to uh, be, uh, become a, a subject of manipulation. 
And as we know, the Russians are masters of manipulation. So, uh, and I know stories, for instance, from Colonel Koch himself, uh, how, uh, what they did when he was there, how they staged these things so to show the uh, picture which they want to be presented. So, and uh, um, why should we all help them in this? I don't understand. And um, uh, this debate I have uh, continually with Catholics with whom I stay in touch. You know, I still have contacts uh, in uh, Rome and, uh, well, um, their argument is that uh, uh, they uh, don't agree with what uh, uh, Russians conclude out of these meetings or out of these encounters, because recently also there was this uh, uh, Zoom meeting, yes, a video meeting between the Pope and the, uh, the um, and Kirill, and uh, um, it seems that. Uh, uh, they still cannot understand that this, um, uh, the proper, <laughs> I'm sorry to say so, but the proper way of talking is not something that uh, has any value for the Russians, oh, honestly, I mean. Uh, and, and now that uh, I had the, an exchange with one of the bishops that, uh, that I read that Pope is planning to go to Jerusalem to meet uh, Kirill again. So I said, I, why? What is the po point of meeting him again? Uh, uh, the answer was uh, Pope wants to meet him face to face. And so what? I wrote back, will he punch him into face or what, what is he going to do? <laughs> what is it? I mean, why? What's the reason? But uh, still, and then about the rhetoric and, uh, of the Pope, this is how they speak. They never mention, um, uh, in my memory, I can't recall them mentioning uh, aggressors. You know, they try to uh, put everything into uh, the basket of uh, those who are um, victims and so the, this uh, uh, he spoke about it very openly that terrible things are happening in Ukraine and there are so many victims and civilians are killed. Uh, he speaks about it openly, but he is not uh, mentioning uh, uh, Russia. So that's their policy. I mean, they cannot change their policy. It seems so easy. So. Uh, thank you, uh, and thank you very much for this uh, mention of uh, manipulations, because uh, I would like to note that uh, um, the paragraph in Havana Declaration of uh, 2016 about the Ukrainian conflict uh, nowadays uh, looks uh, like uh, a block from the Russian state propaganda I know. Uh, about uh, where you were uh, eight years and so on. Um, and uh, it, it, it is very, uh, very, very good uh, note about manipulation, I, I, I think. Yes, no, I had, the, at that time, I had even a meeting with the head of the um, uh, press office uh, in Vatican. Uh, and I said, uh, you know, I mean, we were laughing that why do you accept uh, Russia as the third Rome? Do you want to have the third Rome? <laughs> But still, so they do. Thank, thank you. Uh, the next question from Silver, uh, please. Uh. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you, Professor, for uh, all this insight and comments on uh, on uh, the history uh, of Georgian Church and also the history and uh, related manipulations uh, of. Uh, of Russia, uh, as you know, uh, Russia is also using uh, history related ma uh, manipulations uh, um, in the context of uh, Orthodox Church history uh, in Estonia. But uh, my question is about the uh, situation uh, or ongoing war against uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, what is your opinion how it will uh, affect or influence on, on the uh, situation or inter-church relations in Ukraine, uh, what will be the future of the autocephalous Ukrainian uh, Orthodox Church and the future of uh, Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine? 
especially taking into account that Russian aggression uh, has been also directed against the Orthodox communities uh, and also Russian Orthodox communities in Ukraine. Yeah. Yes, I remember this, that the uh, Russians bombed Magnitogorsk, this uh, monastery. Mag uh, Magnitogorsk? No, no Magnitogorsk. Uh, um, Svetogorsk. Svetogorsk. Uh, uh, Svetogorsk. Uh, Lavra, yes, Svetogorska Lavra, yes. And then uh, this, the um, uh, um, abbot was very <laughs> surprised that it happened, but yeah, that it happened. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, it is I mean, very difficult to predict. There are so many uh, things happening every day and the chain, you know, which affects the flow of uh, the situation. But uh, I think uh, uh, you, uh, Orthodox Church in Ukraine has a better chance now, perhaps, you know, I want to believe it. Uh, perhaps uh, it will become a member of the World Council of Churches. I mean, it's not a big deal. We know World Council of Churches, you know, I know it very well. And especially now, I mean, it's, uh, but still it's a forum of all Christian churches and uh, somehow everyone, want, all churches want to be there apart from Georgia and Bulgaria that Russia pushed them to leave and then it stayed itself. Um, and uh, I think uh, somehow this uh, international community should uh, 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 show somehow this uh, dissatisfaction with the behavior of the Russian Orthodox Church, because this is very clear. I mean, uh, uh, um, Kirill's uh, uh, sermons are, I don't know, I mean, uh, does he write it himself? I wonder, and I want to ask Chapnin or someone who knows this insight, does he write himself or someone helps him? These are just really, uh, absolutely violent uh, and uh, so uh, unfair uh, sermons uh, in, in this situation when there is a war and uh, so many people die. So, um, so Russian Orthodox Church, uh, I, I think if it is excluded from a World Council of Churches, that will be a fair um, decision on my part, but they will not do it. Uh, certainly. Um, apart from that, um, what can you do? I mean, it's a monster in itself. It's huge. It's, uh, sorry, with the Russian, Russians, if Russians, but still, it's, uh, it has its own uh, politics and uh, certainly it follows its own agenda. But uh, how Orthodox will behave? That's an interesting question. Yeah, I wonder, yeah. I think all Orthodox should uh, show now solidarity to the uh, church in Ukraine. Um, yeah, and the Ukraine should also shake up a little bit and uh, uh, not to have so many churches in one place, Orthodox churches. Yeah, there are these possibilities, uh, all driven uh, by this uh, effect of the war. Yeah, it's a very big thing. Yeah. People die, and it's a war. So we'll see. In in terms of inter-orthodox relations, uh, from uh, after 2016, it's been a, you know, I mean, pandemic helped also, uh, but uh, there are no relations. Also, uh, um, inter-confessional uh, dialogue. I mean, what, what, how can they uh, dialogue with orthodox when orthodox don't dialogue with one another? So I don't know, we are in impasse. Yes, thank you. Uh, and I, I, I would like to put uh, some controversial complexity uh, in our discussion. Um, now uh, in theological uh, circles, there is a very sensitive discussion of, of the relationship uh, between Christian and national identities. And uh, for example, a declaration on the Russian uh, world teaching uh, which has already been signed by over a thousand uh, theologians, priests, and ordinary Christians has appeared, and I, I know that you uh, signed it, and me too. Uh, 
uh, this declaration ap uh, applies uh, to the doctrine of the Russian world, uh, in particular, uh, the accusation of the heresy of ethnophilitism condemned by the Council of uh, Constantinople in uh, uh, 1872. Uh, for uh, our participants who don't know what uh, ethnophilitism ethnophilite is, according to the Council's definition, I will clarify it is a, a placing of tribal or national uh, interest above uh, church uh, interest. However, uh, if we delve deeper in the context of the condemnation of this heresy, we can see that uh, the emergence uh, was related to the Greek-Bulgarian schism when uh, the Bulgarian church proclaimed its uh, autocephaly. In particular, uh, responding to Constantinople's policy of Hellenization of the church uh, on Bulgarian territory. This uh, context uh, immediately, immediately uh, conjures uh, up uh, associations uh, for me, uh, for example, with the contemporary uh, relationships uh, between the Russian church and the Ukrainian church. Uh, can we say that the application of the heresy of uh, ethnophilitism is a good idea? Is there no high hidden uh, ecclesial imperialism in the condemnation of the primacy of uh, national interests over uh, ecclesial interests? Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Andrei, I think uh, uh, as far as I understand uh, ethnophilities, it is uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, exactly ethnic element is uh, taken here not national in terms of national, politically national. So ethnic, like for instance, ethnic Greeks or ethnic Russians, which is um, uh, true about uh, Ruski Mir. Ruski Mir exactly, uh, it, it's not only Ruski Mir, but also this, uh, the whole, um, uh, this, uh, the uh, Institute of uh, pol um, Politics of Culture in Russia, uh, Shirba, uh, what's his name, a philosopher uh, who led this uh, um, project, they decided, uh, they worked on it, actually philosophers in the 90s worked on this, and they decided that uh, all people who speak Russian outside of Russia should be uh, part of the Russian world. Uh, and uh, uh, this Russian word, the Ruski Mir, which is uh, a uh, not only linguistic uh, sort of club, but it's a, uh, a huge umbrella organization for um, cultural uh, and uh, um, spiritual, as we know, uh, the first thing uh, proposed and political and other things. So, I mean, uh, when uh, people are uh, uh, into that uh, uh, framework of mind, uh, what do you propose? Uh, I mean, how can you have a, a normal conversation with this? Uh, you, know, you cannot uh, debate, uh, uh, you know, what can you say to these people? How could you decide that old people should be? And then they counted and they were very proud that uh, all people outside of Russia, they are exactly the same number of people speaking Russian outside of Russia as in Russia. And they were proud of this discovery. So, so the Russian world will work also outside of Russia. Yeah. Um, okay, but uh, I only want, yes, and then you said about um, this ethnic, uh, uh, yeah, I think a, a national, uh, I understand a national now as political, national like, for instance, uh, you know, Esto Estonian nationality, uh, not es ethnic uh, Estonian, yes, and Estonian nationality certainly is above uh, or any uh, religious um, identity within Estonia, but um, uh, but uh, uh, ethnophilism uh, was not about that. Ethnophilism was about uh, that. Uh, or, or, for instance, if we take Georgian example, that uh, Orthodox Georgia is 
more uh, or orthodoxy in Georgia is uh, means more than uh, any other concept, uh, uh, social or political concept. And this is not uh, the right way of thinking. This is condemned. So that's what the Russians are advocating in my view in Russian world. That's why I brought this example, uh, how they are masterly using the um, Russian language because Russian culture is certainly, we all adore Russian culture uh, and uh, we are proud of knowing Russian language, but you know, uh, I mean, if it uh, makes us uh, part of the Russian world, then I'm not sure. Could we say that uh, ethnophiletism is uh, some kind of sacralization of a uh, nation? Maybe? Yes. I would not use nation though, because you know it's uh, it should be uh, used with the caution because nation uh, is a good word, but also uh, can be nationalist can be a bad word. So sort of. yeah, ethnic ethnic uh, side of nationalism. Yeah, sacralization. Yeah, it's of sacralization to to identify it one, with one. Yeah, so to say that you know uh, Greeks are or Georgians are because they are Orthodox or uh, you know, in Georgia, it's still alive. Uh, you can hear, from instance, that uh, if you are Georgian, you are Orthodox, for instance, or uh, if you, you are, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> if you are non-Orthodox but Georgian, uh, you are more Orthodox than, for instance, uh, French, who is Orthodox. <laughs> you know, this kind of mentality. So no, th this is alive. It's it's a living thing with us yeah yes i see uh thank you um uh, i think we we can uh ask uh, maybe two more uh questions yes irina but uh, uh, let's see are there any raised hands now uh irina and then Jan. Oh, Jan. well um i have actually a small question but it concerns the um well uh f the, the problem of like dealing with um, uh, the soviet past in church um i mean when i was in church i mean i was surprised that the the museum in gori you know the birthplace of stalin is included in uh, every tour that they, they, they're making and i think uh, you know in every souvenir shop you can buy um uh, souvenirs with, with the face of the, uh, you know, of uh, Yosef uh, Vissarionovich. But uh, my question was actually about um, the uh, Georgian policy to, towards, uh, uh, hi you know, history politics and, uh, for example, uh, the uh, KGB archives, are they all open? And is there a, like a process of, uh, you know, like just looking at the, 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 the role of the church during the Soviet period and how the historians and uh, people in the church deal with this. So no, it's a very difficult uh, issue, Irina. Uh, uh, church archives, uh, once I went uh, to the Patriarchate asking uh, uh, that I wanted to look at the archives, <laughs> they couldn't even believe that uh, what I was asking, you know, <laughs> so they kicked me out immediately. But uh, even KGB archives, this lustration process has not happened in Georgia, like in other Baltic countries, for instance, or in other places in GDR, uh, I mean, in Germany, in the part of GDR. And that's a big issue for us. Politically, it's a very um, uh, sort of, uh, um, you know, it, it uh, creates, uh, it stumbles the process yeah, of uh, opening up of the society. But on the other hand, imagine, for instance, our patriarch became, uh, was enthroned in 1977. Imagine it was a solid Soviet Union and uh, he's been patriarch since and um, he's never spoken. Uh, I think uh, Maxim spoke, yes, Bulgarian Maxim spoke before he died. He spoke against, uh, or he mentioned his uh, involvement in, uh, communist um, um, era into uh, you know some activities but uh, here you can't find anything like this because unfortunately 
uh, uh, Ilya has become a, a figure of veneration. You know, uh, he's been, uh, uh, and it damages him very much. I think it uh, destroyed him as a person because uh, he's been uh, venerated uh, and uh, it uh, detached him even further from reality. So, you know, um, and uh, KGB archives are not accessible. I'm working now on one project. It's a Harvard University project on uh, the Soviet uh, Georgia. And I was asked to write something on uh, the 60s and uh, 70s uh, with Ch between church and state. And there is very little material and I can't find archives. The best archives are in Moscow and Kiev. <laughs> And, uh, okay, so I can't access them. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, uh, and the last question of our seminar uh, uh, will be from uh, Jan. Uh, thank you. Uh, I hope the question is sort of good as a, a concluding one. Um, it, it's related to the article or the chapter that we, uh, that we uh, read for this week. Um, in, on page 20, you refer to um, uh, Galaitzidis, um, yes. suggesting uh, that the fullness of the eschatological discernment is of the utmost importance to the church um, in order to understand it, its place in, in life and the world, uh, which I found, found interesting. But then um, you say that it's deficient in the Orthodox Church today. And I was wondering, um, is it then a, a church-wide thing? Or are there um, national churches or local churches that are, uh, are engaging in this, this discernment? Um, and I asked this because it was uh, also you who mentioned uh, that the American Orthodox Church does better understand its place in, in a secular society. Um, so I was wondering, um, are there differences between two churches or is this church-wide? Um, I think uh, whenever national interests are uh, dominant, uh, and it's always the case with uh, autocephalous church, uh, but not uh, for, uh, Orthodox Church of America is a very different case, you understand them, I mean, uh, but uh, the local churches, I call them autocephalous churches, uh, when they are national churches, you know, like Georgia and Russia, um, it is very difficult to avoid, uh, um, because of autocephaly, I believe, I don't know, I believe, uh, and because of not having uh, opportunity to reflect on it in a conciliar uh, way, uh, what it means. Uh, because it doesn't matter if one of them decides or one of them will come out with a, a conclusion. It will not uh, be uh, conciliar. Um, and I think uh, it's very uh, difficult to, uh, for any idea, even eschatology, to overcome uh, the uh, uh, national interest when the church is so strongly bound with it, you know. And I see it, it's um, unfortunately, I see it. It's not something that I um, invented or I wish it were not there. And I wish I could see this ideal picture, which I have the end, uh, the last chapter of the book will be about Eucharistic uh, ecclesiology. And, uh, you know, I'm a big admirer of Afanasius, uh, uh, ecclesiology and who, who is not and uh, I'm writing on that and that's what we want to believe and that's what uh, we want to you know, be our guide but unfortunately at the moment the churches are uh, bound to these uh, other powers and they cannot uh, uh, somehow you, you one even feels uh, sorry for churches that they they are so much kept you know in this uh, under this uh, Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to uh, note uh, that uh, last uh, season of our seminar series, uh, we had a, a seminar about Afanasiev's uh, ecclesiology and uh, everybody would uh, see it uh, on, uh, on the YouTube. Uh, Dr. Anastasia Wooden told us uh, about 
his yes. approach. Yeah, she, she's uh, written on ecumenical understanding or something. Yes, on ecumenical. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Tamara for this interesting discussion. It was very political, but uh, that is not surprising as you put a lot of emphasis on the political factor in your book. And uh, I want to give the floor to Irina to conclude. Uh, well, it's difficult to conclude. It feels that we've only started <laughs> um, raising these uh, issues. So I, 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 th I think uh, um, we kind of came back to the topic which, uh, to the theme which Tamara has opened her presentation about autocephaly. And I think in the end, if I heard you correctly, you said that autocephaly is not an answer and there is actually the need for this uh, uh, kind of conciliarity be be between the churches because, you know, this kind of uh, responsibility that uh, each church has, uh, you know, before, before the, the Christian community uh, world, worldwide, and I think that's that's exactly what uh, uh, we are witnessing today. So I, I, I thank you very much, and I would like to uh, for you to come again and present your book at, uh, at the point when it's ready. Um, I hope there will be an opportunity, and I wish you all the best with um, this process and. Uh, Thank you so much. So nice to be together with such a nice group of people. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And happy happy Easter. So yes. It's, it's happy Easter. Um, happy Easter to everybody because we have people who celebrate this week oh, <laughs> already and uh, next week. So mm -hmm. uh, thank you for participating and uh, enjoy the spring. Bye.